And turn with me in the Lord's Word to Isaiah chapter 41, Isaiah 41. The elders asked if I would, in my last service here, give my testimony of the Lord's saving grace. Happy to do that. Glad that I have a testimony of that grace. I trust that the Lord will hide me behind the Lord, and what I say will be a help to you. Isaiah chapter 41, let's begin reading the Lord's word in verse 1. Let's hear his word. Keep silence before me, O islands, and let the people renew their strength. Let them come near. Then let them speak. Let us come near together to judgment. Who raised up the righteous man from the east, called him to his foot, gave the nations before him, and made him rule over kings? He gave them as the dust to his sword and as driven stubble to his bow. He pursued them and passed safely, even by the way that he had not gone with his feet. Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I am he. The isles saw it and feared. The ends of the earth were afraid, drew near, and came. They helped every one his neighbor, and every one said to his brother, Be of good courage. So the carpenter encouraged the goldsmith, and he that smoothed with the hammer him that smote the anvil, saying, It is ready for the soldering, and he fastened it with nails that it should not be moved. But thou, Israel, art my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. Thou whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called thee from the chief men thereof and said unto thee, Thou art my servant. I have chosen thee and not cast thee away. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word for his name's sake. Please bow your head and heart with me for a moment. Let's ask the Lord for his presence, his grace, his power this evening. Father in heaven, in Christ's name, we pause to look to thee for all the grace that will be needed to make this time in thy house a time that's profitable. It will be a time that's beneficial to thy cause and to the lives of thy people and to the heart of this servant. Put a guard about his lips. May he say only that which is in agreement with thy word and pleasing to thee. May tonight we find our souls lifted heavenward as we hear of thy amazing grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. My text is found in the last part of verse 9 and into verse 10. Thou art my servant. I have chosen thee and not cast thee away. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Probably more than any other passage in the Lord's Word, God has used those two verses to direct and to shape my ministry. But... That story, which accounts for over half of my life, was against another story, a lifelong story. The same backdrop that everyone else has who comes into this world. I was born a sinner, 
born that way, conceived in iniquity. I wasn't born innocent. God did not bring me into this world with a blank slate. But I came born with a sinner's heart that was, from the very beginning, deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. A heart that needed to be cleansed from all of the sin that plagued it, whether it be the sin that came upon it through Adam's transgression or the sins that would eventually grow out of that bent towards sin and against God. I was barely born into a Christian home. I say barely because the, the night that my mother and father got saved in the same church, by the way, that the Lord saved me some 13 years later, she was carrying me in her womb the night that she walked down the aisle and asked the Lord to save her, just barely. My mom and dad got saved that night, and I was therefore born into a, a Christian home. My only a, a, a side light here, my only claim to fame is that I was born on the same day that Ian Paisley got married, October the 13th, 1956. I told him one time a lot of years ago, two things happened on that day. One man went into bondage and one got out of it, and I'll leave it to you to decide which is which. That's my claim to fame. That church was called Calvary Baptist Tabernacle, and the pastor's name was the Reverend Lou Gehrig Bradley. His father had hopes that he would be a great baseball player, hence the name Lou Gehrig. He was an excellent baseball player as well as his brother, but the Lord called him to the ministry, and he actually is still the pastor of that same church. He's now in his late 80s, still pastoring. He played a very important role in my life on more than one occasion. Now, the reason that my mother and father were in church that Sunday was because of the influence of my aunt and uncle, who were brothers married sisters. Can I put it like that to make it plain? Brothers married sisters. So my aunt and uncle, my uncle was my dad's brother. His wife was my mom's sister. It was because of their influence that they were found in that church that night. And the Lord saved them. And they were in that church, my aunt and uncle, because of the actions of another couple in that church, Alden and Jean Artis. Now, by any definition, they were odd. Odd. Lovely couple. Solid Christians. But they were different. You knew it when you walked into their house and you found probably 35 to 40 stuffed monkeys all around the ceiling in the living room. She liked stuffed monkeys. I don't know why, but she did. But out an artist worked with my uncle at DuPont, and regularly he asked him to come to church. Won't you and Toby, her name was Tobitha Toby for short, will you and Toby come to church with us tonight? He kept putting him off and putting him off and putting him off, until my uncle got tired of it and said, we're just going to go to church with him tonight and get this guy off my back. Well, that night he got saved. And the Lord eventually moved upon his heart to be a missionary, and he went to the field of Nigeria for about seven years. War broke out, and my wife, my aunt's health failed, and uh, they came back home, and then he served as a pastor at a Baptist church for the rest of his life. All because of this odd couple who kept saying, come to church with me. Do you see what you can do? Do you see what just staying with something? Well, they might ignore you. I'm tired, I don't want to hear it, but just gently keep coming back. Please, won't you come to church? 
You just don't know what the Lord's going to do from that simple invitation if you just stay at it. Don't assume it's useless. I introduced them, my aunt and uncle, into my testimony because even as a very young boy, I remember them telling me, teaching me about the Lord, singing the, the, the typical children's choruses. In those days, they had plenty of opportunity to do that. Uh, most of my parents had to work to provide for the family. We, we, weren't, we weren't in the upper class, to put it mildly, so they were both working to put food on the table for the four kids that were under their roof. And so my, my aunt, while my mother worked often, was the babysitter. And I can still remember Aunt Toby, that's her name, Aunt Toby. Plump. Aunt Toby was plump. You think I'm plump? Hmm. Aunt Toby was the sweetest lady you would ever meet. To this day, I remember her teaching me about Jesus, about being saved. She had such a sweetness about her that really influenced me. I, I, I loved being around Aunt Toby. You see, you, you never know what influence that you can have upon your nephews, your nieces, your grandchildren. It wasn't just, well, going to Aunt Toby, we're going to play games and do all kinds of stuff. No, she, was, she, had, a, she had a mission with with her nephew. She wanted to see him saved. So very early, she just, every time, teaching me about the Lord. You don't know what kind of influence you can have upon your grandchildren, upon whoever it is. But you got to believe that you can. If you don't believe that, you won't try. They went off to the mission field, and I began to grow up and show that I was indeed born a sinner like every other child. During my childhood years, my parents' attendance at the house of God was marked, sadly, by inconsistency. Sometimes we would all go to Sunday school and go to church for months, months on end, and then something would happen. I don't know what it was, but whatever it was, they stopped going to church until Brother Lou, that was his name, until Brother Lou came out along with one of his deacons. He'd always have something, some little story to tell the kids, but the end was, to, we miss you at church. Won't you come back? After that visit, sure enough, we all piled into the car, that little Ford Falcon, on Sunday morning and go off. And I still remember to this day how awkward, how strange I felt after being away for so long, walking back into the Sunday school class, feeling so odd. I am a stranger here. It wasn't comfortable. Let me tell you, moms and dads, don't stop. Don't let anything get in the way. Keep bringing them, keep bringing them, keep bringing them, and bring yourself in the meantime. Faithfulness in your attendance at the house of God was one thing I learned from that difficulty. Faithfulness. It's never a question of if I'm going to church. Never a question. I'm going. Settle it. It was during the summer of 1968, while I was a boy of 11, that my father suffered a complete mental breakdown. He was in the hospital for a couple of weeks, could not see him except to the hospital window. And it was such a sad time to see my father like that. But again, this was part of God's plan. It wasn't happening by it's a coincidence or, well, no, nope, this was part of God's plan for my life. Things that I needed to learn from that, and they came in very handily later on in my own life. It was at the big end of the following summer that I found myself sitting on the back row of 
Calvary Baptist Tabernacle. When my parents had first been saved. Brother Lou was preaching a gospel message that Sunday morning. I can't tell you the text. I can't tell you the sermon. I just remember he was preaching about heaven and hell. And you go to one of two places. You go to heaven or you go to hell when you die. And there's no other option. And once you die, it's over. No second chances. At the end of that message, he asked all of those in the congregation that morning if they were concerned about where they would spend eternity, after he'd emphasized how long eternity was, if they would raise their hand. I had heard messages like this many, many times, but there was something different that Sunday morning. I know now what was going on. It was the Holy Ghost bringing me under conviction for my sin. I hadn't felt that before. Oh, I knew when I did wrong, but actually being convicted about it before God. I began to think about heaven and hell. And I knew that if I died that day, I was going to hell. I believed it, you see. It, it was real. I didn't doubt its existence. I didn't doubt the message. The church was built on a very busy boulevard, and cars were just flying by, and all it would take is, I mean, here's the sidewalk, and here's the road. It would just take one misstep, and I'm thinking about this. One, some kid just shoved me. I'm dead. I'm in hell, and there's no end to it. Was I afraid? Yes, I was afraid. Should people be afraid when they're lost and they think about hell? You better believe they should be afraid. It is to be feared. But there was no altar call. He wasn't really one that was into altar calls. Baptist preacher, but he wasn't one that was into altar calls. He simply asked those people who were concerned about their soul and their eternal destiny to raise their hands. And I thought I was off the hook, you know. I, I could just acknowledge, you know, I'm, I'm concerned, but he said, I want you to raise your hands. And you know what? This hand went up just like this, just, you know, maybe you won't see it, but he saw it. I, I'm down like this. And then he said, I'd like to ask all those that raise their hands to stay behind. Mm. But I stayed behind. No one else did. I conclude that I must have been the only one who raised his hand that morning, or else there were others, and they didn't stay behind. But it was just Brother Lou and me in a side room off the pulpit and we sat down, he once again, very simply, explained to me the gospel. And he said, John, would you like to be saved? Yeah. Well, do you want to pray or do you want to pray after me? I'll pray after you. Scared to death. I don't want to mess this up. So you go ahead and I'll follow you in prayer. And I did that. And I asked the Lord to save me. I regretted that decision years later. And you'll find out why. But I did. I asked the Lord to save me, and the Lord saved me. You see, what happened that Sunday morning in middle of September was what the Lord said in verse 9 of this text, Thou art my servant, I have chosen thee, and not cast thee away. That happened because I was one of those before the foundation of this world that God chose to be one of his redeemed people. That's how it always happened. Jesus said, all that the Father giveth me will come to me. Not, not most of them, not 99.9%, .9%, but all of them will come to me. It's going to happen. If God chose them, they've got to come. 
And you see, it was just God's time for me to come to Christ. I didn't understand any of that at that point in time. I just knew I'm lost. I'm headed to hell. I need Christ to save me from my sin. Those sins had been just flooding my mind, particularly that summer. Just specific sins come. Mm, I did this and I did that. And I said this and I said that. And one of the things that I was, you'd probably be surprised at this, but I love to argue. Does that shock you? My mom. I would argue and argue and argue. You know, if she said it was square, I said it was round. That's the kind of arguing we would do. Fighting all the time. My life changed that morning, afternoon actually. I went out different. I went out happy. It was like I was walking on cloud nine. I don't know how long I was in there, but it was, you know, this is hot. A Ford Falcon in those days didn't have any air conditioning, and my dad was sitting in the car with my sister. It must have been sweating bullets. Never said a word of complaint. Didn't ask me what happened even, why I was there. That was my dad, very quiet. But I'm sitting there driving back home. I'm not going to argue with my mother anymore. Never again. Wish I'd held to that, but that's where my heart was. I wanted the change. That night during the evening service, Brother Lou had asked me to come forward when I was, that afternoon when I was saved, and confess Christ publicly. I'm walking down the aisle again, but it's a little different young guy walking down the aisle, and I publicly confess that Jesus Christ had saved me, and I, <laughs> Mom was over there, just tears rolling down her cheeks. The prayers for her boy had been answered. I was to cause her many more tears, however, in the years to come. I'm getting down to the teenage years, junior and senior high school years. I was in a public school, and when you're in a public school, nothing's changed from that day to this. I would say it's much more intense now, but there was constant, tremendous peer pressure. And you want to be accepted by your friends. You don't want to be looked upon as an oddball and to stand up and Profess Christ as your Savior. You see, there were you see there were kids that I was with in that school, my same age, who were Christians, and you knew they were Christians, and you also knew that everyone else looked at them as oddballs. I didn't want that. I wanted people to like me. I wanted people to accept me. I wanted to be looked upon as. I don't know what the word is today. I guess it hasn't changed, but I, I, I wanted to be looked upon as cool. Cool. But, of course, doing that, you have to act like them to be accepted. You've got to be one of them. But this presented its own set of problems as I would, you know, adopt their language and their attitudes, their behavior, and the filthy talk and all that, it brought a problem, and that was guilt. You see, I was saved, and the Holy Ghost was convicting me. Can't, can't do that. And think about Brother Lou that was so great. He always had this evangelist a couple times a year come in, and he was an old Southern preacher. And we would say they preach hard against sin. And I'm, my mom and dad went, you know, a week, a week of, they called them revival meetings. And he would preach, you'd see sweat dripping off of his tie. You could see it just dripping, just soaked in sweat, preaching so intensely. And I'm sitting in that church and thinking, my sin, my sin, my sin. Of course, all those guys had altar calls. Anyone wants to get right with the Lord, whatever, come forward. I can't tell you how many times I went forward in those 
meetings because there was always this battle of trying to be accepted and to be cool, but then I come back to hearing the Word of God and it convicted me and I'm down the aisle again. You see, I was afraid that I wasn't saved maybe. That really began to be a problem for me. Didn't know anything about election, justification, sanctification. I didn't, I didn't know anything. I just knew I was really having a problem with sin in my life. I can't tell you how many times as a teenager that I prayed for God to save me. How many times I got beside my bed and say, Lord, if I'm not saved, then please save me now. And that often happened after some particular sin that I had committed. I wanted to make sure. But as I came to the end of my high school years, particularly my senior year, a hardness began to grow over me. I was still attending Calvary Baptist Tabernacle with my parents, but it was all a front. I had no interest in being there. I had no interest in hearing what the preacher had to say. It was what my parents expected of me, and so I did it. Soon I was in full-fledged rebellion. I was sitting in church one morning, and I said to myself, what am I doing here? I'm just playing the role of a hypocrite. I'm out of here. And out of here I was. It was a dark period for the next three years of my life, from age 18 to 20. I entered a world of drugs and alcohol, the nightclubs, and all that goes with that kind of life. I lived to party. I had a job, held down the job quite well, but what I was really living for was to party to stay high as often as I could and to indulge my flesh. During it all, however, when I wasn't stoned on pot or inebriated on alcohol, I was miserable. Now it's true, there were miserable times from the drink I remember one night well being so drunk, I was vomiting in the toilet and I could not lift my head up. Oh, that was misery. Did I stop? No. I kept on. I wanted the good life, the feeling but when I was not high and sober, I was afraid. I knew that heaven and hell was real. I had my own apartment at that point in time, and I remember just pacing the halls of that apartment, my bedroom to the kitchen, bedroom to the kitchen, full of anxiety. I'd be afraid to go to sleep at night because my thought was, if I die in my sleep, I'm going to hell. Because Christians don't live like this. Yet I put on a brave face. It was during that three year roughly stint of indulging the world that I met a young woman that I wanted to be with. She was home on leave from the army. And she said, if, that, if we were going to be together, that I needed to join the army. Proverbs 7 came to mind. Now it does, didn't then. So I joined the army. It wasn't but a week in basic training when I asked myself the question, what in the world have you just done? If you know anything about, at least how it was in my day, basic training was not pleasant. 
I wanted out as soon as I could get out. Well, I made a deal one night, part of the punishment I had for using the word gun. You don't use the word guns in the army, it's your weapon. I had to do a thousand and one push-ups, or as far as I could get, because the drill sergeant heard me talk about, he's guarding the guns. What did you say, Wagner? He's guarding the guns. Knock down. Just fall down, start knocking them out, and then do push-ups. I had no idea what I had done. They're not guns, they're weapons. And while I was doing push-up, you've got to repeat after me. These are my guns, and they're for fun. These are my weapons, and they're for war. I did as many as I could, don't remember how many that was, but then part of the punishment was guarding this empty warehouse throughout the night without sleep. Well, I prayed. Lord, if you get me out of this, I'll come back. It wasn't long after that that I received a medical discharge. I could have stayed in, he said, you can, but what you have, this dishydrotic eczema of the hands and feet, oh boy with the details, gone away now, but it did let me get out of the army and I said, send me home, medical discharge. I went home a day before the men graduated from basic training. Now, what do you think I did when I went home? Right back to the old friends, right back to the drugs. I forgot all about the deal I had made. But during this time, I ran into a woman from Calvary Baptist Tabernacle who I had known for years. Shirley Jackson, her name was. Sweet lady. And we bumped into each other in this five and dime store in the city in which I, which I was living. And she saw me and went up to me, big smile on her face. And she invited me to come back to church. I smiled and said, nah, Shirley, that's not for me. Okay for you, but it's just not for me. Tears began to fill her eyes, and through the tears she smiled, and she said to me, you'll be back. I blew her off. I was attending a state school at that point in time, and God brought, uh, he was the professor, the head of the drama department, and we were, I was involved in plays. He said, I was doing plays in high school. Well, that'd be fun, let's do plays in college. And I met Dr. Starnes. After half a year, he saw I was troubled. He read it. Troubled young man, he wanted to try to help me. So what commenced for the next year was counseling once every week in one of the college rooms, and all he knew was Freudian psychology. That means I had to tell him everything about my life. He knew things about me that no one has ever known about me. Going back as far as my memory could take me so he could try to figure out what happened that was causing me all the trouble. So I've told him my life story, up to that point in time anyway. And at the end of a year, this is a, a, an unsaved college professor who said to me one day, I can't, I, about Jesus Christ, I can't believe that one, the death of one man could have this effect. That's, that's what his mindset. He was lost, but he said to me, at the end of that session, I think you, go, you need to go and see Pastor Lou. It blew me away. I immediately recognized I was going to have to give up my rock and roll music. I had quite a large collection of records. The young people don't know what records are, but I had quite a large collection of hard rock. My drugs, all my paraphernalia, it was expensive. And I'd be giving up all the, the fun. So I ran out of that college classroom, ran down to the men's bathroom in the basement of that building, and just sat on the floor. I don't know how long I was there, 
But I will tell you that while I was sitting there and thinking about all of that, it was as if the Lord said in my heart, it's over. This life is over. I got up, went back upstairs to that college classroom, and he was still sitting there waiting for me. I said, would you call Brother Lou? And he did. That was it. Once that happened, I went home. I destroyed all my paraphernalia. I trashed all the records. It was over. That lifestyle was over. And I've never gone back since. You see, while I had no right to call myself a Christian during that time period, had no right to do that, the fact was, I was still a Christian. I was the prodigal son. I was the wayward child. But God, just like the prodigal, he came to his senses. And he came to his senses, and I came to my senses because of the grace of God. God would not, he would not lose me. All that the Father hath given me, I will raise up at the last day. And that included me. And if Christ had let me go on my way, I would not be raised up at the last day living like that. Because it would be a declaration that I'm not one of his. Things began to change. Funny enough, there was a time before I went off to college in South Carolina, there was a time when a temptation came to go back to that nightclub that I went to so often. I did. I walked in, heard all the, there were always live bands there, heard the bands, people on the dance floor, all the drinks. I stood there and I walked out never, ever darkened its doors again. I couldn't. This is not where I belong. This place is not my home. I walked away. You never know, folks, how and who the Lord can use to bring some wayward child back home. He used an unsaved college professor tied up in Freudian psychology, trying to help me to bring me to a meeting with the man who led me to the Lord as a boy of 11, 12. You never know. Don't give up hope. If you have wayward children, don't give up hope. Ask the Lord to do whatever it takes to bring them to their senses to bring them to Christ. During this time, again, the story is involved. I, I'm just now coming out of a life of drugs and all that worldly living. I was in a relationship with a young woman that was definitely pulling me away from the Lord. She was a Mormon. At one time in this relationship, I actually told her I'd become a Mormon if you'd marry me. And, and, and then I actually went to a church. And I, when, I, when I went to a Mormon church and heard what those people had to say, this is not the truth. I mean, I was still backslidden, but I know that's not the truth. And then it came to the point now where I've come back to the Lord and wants me to marry her. I had to, to take the words of Paul to Timothy, I had to flee youthful lusts. I had to do that, and I got out of town. I was wanting to go on with my education, and Brother Lou recommended that I go to Bob Jones University, where my brother was already in attendance. Isn't it amazing how Providence works things out? So I started attending BJU 
in January of 1976, and I declared speech for my major. Little did I know that being a speech major, how that was going to help me many years later, as I now have for the last 20 years had the privilege of training men how to preach, homiletics it's called, but teaching them how to preach, and part of that is learning about public speaking, things that are necessary, tools for the ministry. It was there my first semester, January of that year, I was in zoology class. I had to take that because in a state school I had taken a regular three-hour course in biology. At Bob Jones, if you've done that, you can't transfer in and take what they call bonehead science course. You had to take a full-blown three-hour course. I chose zoology. I had no idea what it was about, but I just chose zoology. And I walked into the class, and in those days, I don't know how it is now, but you had to sit in, in uh, alphabetical order. Large classroom, maybe 200 students. You had to sit in alphabetical order. And so I found my seat, and there, sitting to my left, was uh, a lovely blue-eyed brunette called Kim. Her last name was Tyree, T, and I was W for Wagner, and so there, there were no other T's, U's, or V's to take that seat. It was Kim and John sitting together for a semester in zoology class. That was the Lord's doing. It wasn't an accident, a coincidence. It was part of the plan from eternity. Even in the giving of our last names. If I had been Rosma, it would have never happened. I mean, that's how detailed God's providential plan is for his people. I was smitten. It took a while for her to realize that I was the one. I've often said I, I, I chased her till she caught me, if you understand that bit of verbiage. We were there, therefore, for a semester, an entire semester, January to May, flirting flirting, me hoping that something will develop. Well, it did, but it took the rest of my time in college, it happened at the very end of my senior year, that we finally got together. We married in May of 1981 in her home church where Kim and I ministered together in the Christian school in that church in New Jersey. A couple of years that church split and we felt before God we could no longer worship there because of the reason for the split. It was her home church and it was very, very hard for her to leave that church she had, was saved in and had grown up in, but she knew we couldn't stay there and be faithful to the Lord. Some months before all of that happened, an old friend from Bob Jones had written me uh, and told, informed me about a, a, a new church in Newtown Square, Pennsylvania, just outside of Philadelphia, that was going, there was a man going to be installed in that church, and he thought I should go there. And I put it away and forgot all about it until the phone rang one cold, rainy March early evening, and he said, John, tonight's the night when John Greer is going to be installed in Newtown Square as its pastor. Oh, I'm in the middle of dinner because it's an hour away and it's raining. I, I, I'm, I'm going to go to this. And I just threw on the, I still had my tie on, put the coat on and went out the door. And they're meeting in this house and it was dark and it was raining and they were already started the service. I was late, and I could hear them singing, and I maybe went around to the house to the side to see if there's a door that's open, and I stepped right up to my ankle in a mud puddle. But I still went in, and I walk in the doors, and it was packed. Not a place at one chair. And guess who was sitting in the chair on the right of that empty chair? Alan Cairns. Alan Cairns. 
Well, it began a, a wonderful relationship. Once I heard the preaching and heard these men praying, I said, this is where I want to be. It's where I want my family. We had one child at that point in time, a six-month-old girl. This is where I want to be. These men know God. They're in touch with the Lord. I want to hear this. I had heard Alan Cairns preaching for months on through cassette tapes, and I was thrilled by the preaching. So we came. My wife thought she was afraid I was going into apostasy. She said that. I, I was afraid, she told others, because in America, um, more so then than now perhaps, but in America, Presbyterians were apostates. And what is John going to a Presbyterian church for? She was afraid of that. Now, during that time, I'm, I'm saved, I'm a salesman. Christian school life was over. We had moved on. But there's something I've been struggling with for 10 years, and that's doubts about my salvation. 10 years. Sometimes it was very strong, very strong, and I was deep agony of soul. How can I be saved and do these things that I do? Well, one of the things that I did, John Greer's the pastor meeting in this house. I was a salesman, so I could travel around freely. I had time like that to do, and I would stop by and began to talk to Reverend Greer about my doubts. And we would talk for sometimes an hour, sometimes two hours, and I would get some help, and I'd go on, but then the doubts would come back again. This went on for a good year and a half. Till one evening, I come to see him, and we go up in this little bedroom in his house where the church was meeting, not at that time, but it was a midweek night, and told him the same story. I had seen young people from our church in Greenville come up and work for the summer, a week or two, and they gave their testimonies, and I would say, I don't have a testimony like that. It's so clear cut, and I, I don't have that. It came after about an hour, he said, he said, you know, John, the question is not, is John Wagner good enough for Christ? The question is, is Christ good enough for John Wagner? And I saw in a moment of time what I had been saying for 10 years. Yes, I know Jesus saved, but I want Jesus plus something else, plus some experience to feel so that I will know for sure that I'm saved. And it was like a dagger in my heart. What I had been saying all along was, Jesus, you're not sufficient. You're not good enough for me. I want you plus something else. My, it, it, it hurt to see that's what I had been doing. Well, from that night on, everything changed. I was working as a salesman. I would go into the shipping department. I was just happy as a lark, singing, do you all know the windows of heaven are open? Don't know that chorus, eh? The blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave up my old tattered garments. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven, and that's why I'm happy tonight. Didn't matter if it was night or day. I was, I was singing that all the time to the point where the manager, who was a lost guy, yeah, yeah, I know the windows of heaven are open. He'd just go and start singing it. Such joy, such a burden lifted. For now I knew Christ is good enough. He's sufficient. He's all that I need. It was life-changing. It wasn't long after this that the Lord began to deal with me about the ministry. But I had a problem. You see, the two men I knew the best were the Reverend John Greer and the Reverend Alan Cairns. Giants in my estimation. Spiritual giants. I'd heard them preach. I'd heard them pray. I could never, ever, ever be a pastor. Never, not in a million years. I knew my past, oh so well. I knew my present. I knew all my struggles. 
No, how can I ever be a man of God? Well, I'm struggling with this call, asking the Lord for direction. And I'd been praying for weeks and weeks, Lord, is this what you want me to do? I saw myself as so unfit. And so I knew enough, to, at least I've got to find out from God's Word. So I'm in my normal Bible reading as I would go through, and here I come to Isaiah 41. You see, I felt I was just good to be a castaway. And then while I'm reading Isaiah 41, I come to verse 9, Thou art my servant. I have chosen thee, and not cast thee away. Fear thou not, I am with thee. Be not dismayed, I am thy God. I'll help thee, I'll strengthen thee, I'll uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. And that was the very text I needed for the Lord to tell me, you're my servant, I know all about you, I know everything you've ever done, everything you've ever said, everything you've ever thought, everything you ever will do, but I'm calling you to be my servant. I am not casting you away. You're mine. That settled it for me. Entered the theological hall in 1985, actually the next year, 86, and sat under Mr. Cairns, which was, uh, uh, mm. that was an intense time. We combined uh, two years into one, eight hours a day, five days a week to be lectured, preaching twice a week. You had to have your bachelor's degree and your Greek and Hebrew out of the way even to come in. And my, it was a very intense year, but you know, I was a servant and he got me through what I thought was impossible. He called me after I had come in close to the end of my second year, which was in the church, writing my, for my master's thesis. He called Mr. Cairns Calls and said, you know, there's a work in Orlando. It's a new work, and they're needing a minister. Would you pray about it? And I had no interest in Orlando. I saw it as a big tourist trap. What do I want to go to Orlando for? But, you know, I began to pray. And I agreed to go down. We went down to Orlando uh, in the end of 1988. And I preached to the folks that were gathered in a hotel room, still wondering, Lord, is this what you really want me to do? Where do you want me to go? And then Mr. Cairns preached that evening on that text from David's lips, is there not a cause? As he closes in prayer, I knew it. This is the Lord asking me, John, is there not a cause here for you in this place? That settled it. January of 89, I and my family of five at that point in time moved to Orlando, Florida and established a work there in that city. Saw the Lord after a long haul, saw the Lord build up the work. But then eventually after about 12 years, I began to get unsettled. Couldn't tell you why. It was a great little work, great congregation, very faithful, loyal, loved the people, but I just got unsettled. Began to pray, Lord, is, are you doing this? Is there something else you have for me? Praying and praying and praying. This is like you know, October, November, December, January, I get a call. It's Mr. Cairns again. He knew nothing about it. I told no one about what was going on in my own heart. He said, you know, there's a, a new church plant in Columbia, South Carolina. Would you pray about it? Well, I began to pray, wondering, is this God answering prayer? Dr. Barrett comes three months later, preaches a week of meetings, and in family devotions one morning, he mentions a text of Scripture that the Lord had used in my own heart regarding praying about going to Columbia. On, he had knew nothing about any of this. It all got settled one morning when I said, Lord, I need to know. John 15, I have ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. Mm. Not just in me, but in the lives of others. So in 2002, seven kids now and a wife, we moved to Greenville, South Carolina. 
the end of January 2006, I came home from working on a building that would become eventually our Sunday school room and nursery. I came home, and I came home early. I wouldn't have done that normally, but while I was home that late afternoon, my wife had a grand mal seizure. I took her to the ER, and x-ray showed, CAT scan showed she had a brain tumor. Meningioma is a technical term. 85% of these tumors are benign. That was comforting. Went to the surgery to remove it. The biopsy came back, and hers was not type 1 benign. It was type 2. It wasn't type 3, which is malignant, but it was type 2, which is a more aggressive tumor. The tumor lay right next to a major blood vessel in the brain. They could never, ever always take it out because they could only get so close to that blood vessel. Their fear was if they nicked it and she bled, she'd die on the table. So that meant she went through two craniotomies to keep debulking or making the tumor smaller. As it, <clears throat> as it grew, pressure came on the brain and caused problems. She had three gamma knife radiation treatments where they focused that radiation beam on the tumor itself. It bought time. It bought time, but it kept returning. Normally you live at the most 10 years with a type 2 meningioma. The Lord gave us 15 years together. It reached a stage in 2019 where I knew I had to step away from my church in Columbia to be able to take care of her. We lived in a two-story house and she was losing her ability to be able to climb the stairs. I was quite happy. I had a, made a covenant before God with her. It was going to be in sickness and in health. And I loved her. And she came first before the church. It was hard to step away. This was my life's calling. These were the people I had been preaching to for some 19 years, 17 years. But I had to take care of her. When I received, I submitted my letter of resignation from that church to the Presbytery, who were meeting in Toronto at the time, letting them know what I had decided to do. And I received a letter back from the clerk of the Presbytery, letting me know that my resignation had been received and that all pastoral ties had been severed with the church. I lost it. I had just gone to my study, checked my email, and then I read the letter. Pastoral ties have been severed. It's just the language is what happens when you resign a charge. You see, all along, brothers and sisters, my fear was, and this came out up numerous times in my ministry, both in Orlando and Columbia, that God was done with me. And I could give God a thousand and one reasons why he should be done with me. Failures, we all know what that's like. You fail as a father, you fail as a husband, you fail as a pastor, you fail as a Christian. You see those things, and when you focus upon them, as I was saying this morning, when you begin to focus upon them, you're in for trouble. It's something I had to battle all throughout my ministry. So here I am thinking, well, this is it. This is just God. He is done with me, and he's just setting me aside. I went to the scriptures after that email. You know what my assigned reading was? Isaiah 41. I read 9 and 10, and I knew, I knew God was not casting me away. He wasn't done with me. Even though I had to step down from the work in Columbia, he still had a work for me to do. My preaching ministry was not over. For the next year and a half, 
I took care of Kim. I'm thankful for those days when I worked in a hospital, working my way through college, a lot of things I learned that came in very handy in taking care of her. The Lord slowly took away her abilities. Not all at once. The ability to walk was slowly removed. First she goes to a walker, and then eventually it's in a wheelchair, and then eventually she's bedridden. I will tell you that only those who have lost a spouse, and one of 40 years in my case, understand the pain that it brings. It's indescribable. Half of you has been ripped away. It's pain like I have never felt in my life. The first year after her death, which was June the 10th of 2021, was the most difficult year I have ever faced. There were times in the midst of the pain that I did not want to live. I did not want to live. I asked the Lord, like Elijah, just take me. Please, just take me. I can tell you every time I was at my lowest, the Lord came to me with some verse of Scripture, some devotional, that let me know, you're not cast away, I'm not done with you. And I am here. And I still love you. That's grace. Grace. So, the pain begins to ease, and the Lord begins to put me back to work to tell other people about the grace of my God. To tell them that no matter how bad it gets, God is for you. He's not going to leave you. Everything is going to be all right. It's all working for his good, your good, his glory. It's okay. I can tell you that. I, I, I preached these things for years, you know, but I learned about it in another way when the Lord took him home. I can speak from experience in a way I never could before. He'll never leave you. No matter how hard it gets, he'll never leave you. Am I a castaway? Do you understand that in coming here, and seeing the Lord speak to you through the feeble words of this preacher, God is still saying, I haven't cast you away. I am not done with you. That is grace. And my God is your God. It's exactly how he views you. He's not done with you. There's so much more he has for you to do for him. So fear thou not, for he is with you. Don't be dismayed, whatever happens, because he's your God. He will help you, strengthen you, uphold you with his righteousness. Everything, everything is going to be all right. Praise the Lord. May the Lord use that testimony of his grace in my life to be a blessing to yours. Let's seek the Lord together. Let's all pray.
Father in heaven, as we close this meeting this evening, we realize afresh that it's all of grace from start to finish. That thou dost take the weak things to confound the mighty. O oh God, I pray that thou wilt come amongst thy people here and refresh them with these old truths of saving, life-transforming grace. May they be encouraged. I trust that each one has felt the Lord Jesus speaking to them right where they are. Lord, if thou dost do that, my, my, how we know that thou art for them and not against them. O God, we pray that thou wilt come down as this work needs, like all of our churches, a move of thy spirit. Grant us the grace to seek thee with all of our hearts, to find thee, and to pray down the blessing that thou hast promised, those showers of blessing thou hast promised to give. In our Savior's name we pray, and all for his glory. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 <clears throat>